Hi, Alan here, Our History, Your Story. Today I'm going to tell you all about the National Covenant, a tale of tyranny, abuse of power, a king who believed in his divine right to rule, and a people that stood against his abuse. It all started with a book, went through the killing times, the bishop wars, and ended with two kings dead, another forced to flee, and untold numbers killed. And there's even a ghost story. A little bit about the psyche of the Scottish people. Now, in Scotland, very much today as it was then, if you're out of order, someone's going to tell you, under no uncertain terms, to pack it in and behave yourself. Doesn't matter who you are, whether you're the man on the street or the king himself. Now, we're a straightforward bunch, but this time it was going to land us in a spot of trouble. Now, Charles was the king of both Scotland and England, and ever since his coronation, he started to try and make changes the way that people practice their religion in Scotland. In Scotland, it was a Protestant denomination, whereas in England, it was an Anglican. He was the head of the church in England. But in Scotland, um, it was basically a presbytery, um, where I had a system of church elders and ministers. And above them, there was levels of assemblies that would make decisions on the way the church was run and uh, certain doctrinal issues. It was a very democratic structure. The king in his infinite wisdom kind of wanted to change all this. He quite liked being the head of the church in England. He could tell the bishops what to do and they would implement his, his policies. You know, it was quite a hierarchical structure and the king at his head. Now he was God's representative on earth. He believed in the divine right of kings. And on the 23rd of July, 1637, the common prayer book was to be unveiled, to be read in all the kirks throughout the land. Now needless to say, people were livid at this. And at the kirk behind me, St Giles, one lady picked up the chair she was sitting on and threw it at the pulpit and enraged. The people of Edinburgh rioted and in some kirks throughout land, they didn't even bother with it. They chose to read from the earlier prayer books. After all, everyone knew that Jesus was the head of the church. So all they had to do was simply tell the king the errors of his ways. And here, on the 28th of February, 1638, doing my work for me, all the people of Edinburgh and other places came here and they signed the National Covenant. Now they say that some even signed it in their own blood. Copies of the covenant were sent throughout Scotland for people to sign. On the 21st of November 1638, the first church or Kirk General Assembly took place at Glasgow Cathedral. Now the king initially said that it could take place, but he was buying time and he was using this time to recruit forces to invade Scotland. There would be war. But the Kirk Assembly kept going and he'd done away with all the king's changes, done away with the bishops, done away with the prayer books, back, put it back to the way that the people of Scotland wanted to practice their religion. War was declared and King Charles came up with his forces. Now, we'd done all right in the initial wars, in the initial campaigns, known as the Bishops' Wars, we even captured the king. Now, during this time, Oliver Cromwell reared his ugly head. He had taken over England and declared a republic. Now, he wanted us to give over Charles. We did. And when we did, he was subsequently killed. Now, we never wanted any of this. We just simply wanted the king to leave us to practice our religious um, traditions the way that we wanted to. But the king was now dead. But what were we to do? So we got in touch with his son, also called Charles. He was brought to Scotland from exile and declared Charles II. Now, Oliver Cromwell, he wasn't happy about this. So he sent up forces to Scotland and Scotland was invaded. Charles II mustered his forces, as did Oliver Cromwell. What would be the outcome of this? Well, Charles II was defeated near Worcestershire. If I'm saying that right, I hope I'm saying that right. He was defeated there and again, he fled into exile. But what was in store for Scotland? Well, Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector, he garrisoned an army here, Parliament was declared illegal, and we were basically just under English rule. But not to worry, this was short-lived. And after Oliver Cromwell's death, the whole Republic fell apart. Now, it had gone a bit too far for them, and they decided, just like us, to make Charles II king. Now, when we made Charles II king, we did so under certain conditions. Now, he was to leave the church alone, 
stay out of it. He wasn't Jesus, he wasn't the head of the church, and he was to leave us to practice our religion the way that we wanted to. We had a deal, he even signed the National Covenant. So happy days, he was now king. Everything would be all right, right? Wrong. Charles II passed laws that done away with all the progress that the Covenanters had made. Even going back as to the decisions that were made at the Glasgow Cathedral and done away with them. He reintroduced bishops and he made it so that local lawyers would approve any ministers that were conducting services on their land. He also made it that new ministers would have to do an oath to the bishops and the king. Now, the people were unhappy but a third of ministers refused to take this oath. Who does the king think he is? Again, he's no Jesus. So they refused and they were ousted from their parishes, but they were still followed by a lot of people. And they continued to preach in rural, rural areas as well as in the houses of their supporters. Now, these um, gatherings, sometimes a few hundred, but they grew to the thousands and thousands. These gatherings continued to grow and word got back to the king and he made it illegal. And he said that any land where these gatherings were conducted, the local laird would be fined. Now, the people at these gatherings, they weren't going to stop. And the king's men thought they would come and tell them what to do. They were going to think again. A lot of these people that went to these gatherings were heavily armed. And they were going to put up a fight. The remaining covenanters decided to muster their forces. The discontent had grown, and now was the time to act. Now, initially, they were successful, defeating you know, a number of the king's men. But at the Battle of Bothwell Brig near Glasgow, they were defeated. Prisoners were taken and they were brought here to the Covenanters prison. Well, it wasn't called that then. And it was open air prison. Now they were left here to languish, you know, exposed to the elements, to die of execution, abuse by their guards. It wasn't a very nice deal. And in the 1680s, all remaining Covenanter supporters were hunted down and brutally dealt with. This was a period known as the Killing Times. In 1685, James VII was made King of Scotland and England. Now this made a lot of people a little bit uneasy. Why you might ask? Well, he was Catholic. So people thought that he was likely to interfere with the way that they wanted to practice their religion, that old gem. And subsequently, he was overthrown by his daughter Mary and her husband William. Now they were both Protestant and they left the people of Scotland to worship as they wanted. Laws were passed to restore the Kirk back to the way they wanted it. All the bishops were gone, all the ministers that were ousted out were returned. The church was back to the way the people of Scotland wanted it to be. I promised you a ghost story, didn't I? Well, Greyfriars purported to be the most haunted graveyard in Scotland, in Britain and even Europe probably the world. So this is the tomb of George Mackenzie. Now he was a lawyer and he was the most prominent persecutor of the Covenanters. He relished in their misery and their torture and their ill treatment and for this he was called Bloody Mackenzie. Why is this the most haunted place? Well his victims were just along there, the Covenanters prison where I just was. Now because of this people have said that there's almost a paranormal conflict here. You know, Bloody Mackenzie, their tormentor who relished in their misery and torture, and the Covenanters. So because of this, the, the spirits can't rest. So they're here. Now, there's been a number of um, strange happenings. There's been bruises, scratches, you know, unexplained. And people that go into the Covenanters prison report scratches. There's even someone that said that she had a breath on her neck, pretty spooky stuff. There was also the case of an exorcist who came here to exorcise the spirits from Greyfriars Kirkyard. Now he died a matter of months later. It's a very spooky place. And if you're brave enough, you can go up to the tomb and put your hand through the window. This has been Our History, Your Story. I've been Alan, and this has been The Covenant. Please remember to like and subscribe. Join us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I hope to see you next time.